Thank you for checking out this week's message online. If what you've heard today impacts you in any way, let us know at impact at kingofkingsomaha.org. About two and a half months ago, it, it was a big day, a momentous day for me and my family, for our country, and really the entire international community. A lot of hype leading up to it, TV commercials, social media campaigns. Um, it wasn't like a national holiday. Veterans Day was the day before. Uh, election Day was the week before. No, 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 something far more significant and important the launch of the new streaming service, Disney Plus. <laughs> if you are like my wife and me and have young kids, Disney Plus has turned your life around this winter. <laughs> my son, when we get him up in the morning, he'll you know, cry to let us know, like, hey, come get me out of my crib. And then I'll pick him up. I'll say, hey, good morning, Theo. Love you, buddy. And he'll look at me with his eyes and say, show, show. As if the only thing between him at peace and a temper tantrum is Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. And if you don't know what Disney Plus is, if you haven't watched Frozen 18 times for the last two months, like we have, um, it's, it's, it's essentially a Netflix for all of the content that Disney has ever created like for the last 90 years or so. And so it's all the movies, everything out of the vault. Um, and then they've added Marvel, Star Wars, National Geographic. I've never actually watched National Geographic. By the way, today's sermon is brought to you by our sponsor, Disney Plus. If you are not. Third source revenue, right, Greg? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that at 9 o'clock. Well, anyway. Um, anyway, so here's the thing with, I, I mentioned my son. My daughter, Isla, she's four and a half. And it's been now obviously colder. We're watching more movies, that sort of thing. And she's developed an interesting habit when it comes to watching TV shows and movies. So let's say we're watching The Grinch. Maybe 10 minutes in, maybe 30 minutes in, maybe once it's over. She'll turn to one of us and she'll say, Mommy, Daddy, are there Grinches in our world? To which we'll have to kind of think a little bit. We'll say, well, yes, but they're not green. <laughs> or we'll watch Toy Story and she'll say, do toys talk in our world? We'll say, no, that's, that's pretend. We'll watch Moana and she'll say, are there anthropomorphic oceans in our world? Very skilled vocabulary for a four-year-old. But in those questions, here's what she's doing. She's trying to figure out life. She's trying to make sense of her world. And so when she sees a new cartoon, she's saying, well, is that, is that really true or is that just kind of pretend? She's trying to make sense of the world. And I think that that is a project that does not end at age four, five, six, 13, 20, 30. I think it's something that continually, you and I are on a journey of making sense of the world. Now, if life was peachy, if it was perfect, if there were no problems, no pain, no suffering, there wouldn't be much to make sense of. But I don't need to tell you, and I don't need to make a big point out of the fact that we know that the opposite is quite true that there is pain, that there is difficulty, that there is fear, there is anxiety, there is sin, there is political bickering, there are earthquakes and tornadoes and floods and wildfires. You do turn on the news and you say, how could that person say that to them? And then even moments of self-reflection where you're like, did those words really come out of my mouth? All of this falls under the category of the problem of evil. And for us as Christians, the problem of evil has high stakes. 
Because if there's someone who does not have a relationship with Jesus, that does not believe in God, odds are that's because they look at the pain and the suffering of the world and they would say, how could I ever reconcile that with what Christianity would say, that God is good, loving, and sovereign? If God was like that, why would he allow all this pain? And I think if you were to be honest with yourself, your biggest source of doubt about God, about Christianity, about faith, is the pain and suffering in this world. And so we're asking the question today, in light of all that, how should a Christian make sense of the world? How are we making sense of what's around us? And to answer that question, we're going back to the beginning. And that's what we're doing in this series. We're we're looking at the, the opening chapters of the first book of the Bible in Genesis. And we just believe that what God has revealed to us has some direct bearing on how we make sense of God, ourselves, and the world. And so last week, Mike took us into Genesis 1 and the creation account there. He used big words like singularities and specified complexity. I had to kind of look those up later. But what I loved about what Mike shared is a framework saying there are a lot of things that are interesting in these opening chapters of Genesis. There's a lot of things that we could talk about, we could debate about, this sort of thing. But there are only a few things that are really important. And so we are going to not major in the minors, but we're going to major in the majors. And one of the majors that we just need to remind ourselves of and cement in is that what God has created is fundamentally and unapologetically good. Genesis chapter 1 has like a rhythm to it where God created this, And he looked at it and he said, it is good. Day one through six. And then even when Adam and Eve are created in Genesis chapter two, God looks and he says, that's very good. Where we have to begin is that God created this world good. No mistakes, no errors, no problem, no pain, no evil. So then the natural question is, What happened? Because we're not going to pretend that what we have right now is, well, you know, it's not like horrible, but it's also not perfect. Maybe it's good enough. No. What God created was 100% good, and what we experience now is not. How did we get there? And so to, to do that, I invite you to take your Bibles out. Maybe you're scrolling on your phone, Bible app. You can use the Bible in the church, in the chair back pockets. It's a hard word to say. I know Mike had us on to uh, page one yesterday or last week, so I'm making you work hard today. Flip that page to page two. We're in Genesis chapter three, and just to set this up, what's happening in the chapter before this is that God sets up a garden, a garden that's full of trees, two trees of which are the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God creates Adam, and he sets Adam um, in this garden to take care of it. And he says, you are responsible for this. And he brings all the animals to Adam and says, you name them. And he says, there's there's not a helper who's suitable for Adam. And so Eve is created, and Adam and Eve, the first marriage, God says, be fruitful and multiply, and they are in paradise together. There is one command that God gives to Adam. He said, you can eat of any of these trees, There were a lot of trees. But you cannot eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you do that, you shall surely die. And that sets up Genesis chapter 3. So read with me. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent said to the woman, yes, we're talking about a talking serpent here. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
That part about touching it is actually an imposition that she adds on it. That's not original to what God said. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What's the serpent? And we can confidently say from knowing the New Testament that this is Satan himself, the devil himself. How is he tempting Eve here? He's casting doubt on God's integrity. Saying, Eve, you might assume that God has your best intention in mind because he's a good, loving creator, but he actually just has his own interest in mind. He knows that once you eat of this, you're going to be like him in knowing good and evil, and God doesn't want that. So what happens? Verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, it was attractive, it was appealing, and that the tree was, be, was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. And so even though this episode is the conversation between uh, Eve and the serpent, that little phrase, her husband who was with her, indicates that Adam was not far behind. It's not like all of this is on Eve. Adam was right there with her. And Adam ate. Then the eyes of both were opened. They knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Uh, Peter Bay, who oversees our kids' ministry here, he declined my invitation for him to come out and show you what fig leaves and loincloths looked like. You can ask him that on your own time. So what happens? They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? This is not because God does not know. It's not that he needs information. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Meaning don't hide. I'm asking you straight up. And Adam said, oh, Adam, the woman who you, God, gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. It's not my fault, God. It's Eve's fault. And actually, it's all, actually your fault, God. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, who is the serpent? It deceived me and I ate. So I'm, I'm going to stop reading there. You can read on in your own time or if you get bored with my message. Um, and uh, basically from here, God pronounces consequences on the three parties involved. First upon the serpent, then upon Eve, and then upon Adam. God shows grace in that he covers uh, their shame, their nakedness with clothes uh, made from animal skins, and he expels them from the garden. And he actually sets an angel with a flaming sword at the gate. And the angel is day and night turning around saying no one can be let back in. So, that's the Christian story. Evil, sin, death are here because of a garden, because of a tree, because of a married couple, because of a command, and because of a talking snake. There's a lot that we can glean from the scripture that would help us in our journey of faith. We could talk about the nature of temptation. In many ways, this is like the common story of how we deal with temptation and sin. And the devil, his tactics haven't evolved or changed. He loves to cast doubt on what God has said. He loves to twist God's words. He loves to deceive in the form of questions. Notice that he didn't say, his, the first words out of his mouth, rather, were, did God really say? Those are the same kinds of questions the devil would tempt us with today. He also loves to thrive on half-truths. You shall not surely die. Technically, they didn't die immediately, but death entered into the picture. We could look at the root desire of pride in this story. Pride in us that gives way to sin because we are displacing God and his authority. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Or after we've sinned, we could look at our tendency 
to respond to God in unhealthy ways. So our tendency to hide from him. My guess is you're not going to a local park and hiding behind a tree, right? But you probably are hiding behind busyness, behind activity, behind work, behind relationships, behind social media screens, anything to get your mind off of the guilt that you've incurred through sin. We can, t- we can be prone to be afraid of the image that we build up of God, thinking, well, God, how, how is he going to respond? Right? Adam said, I was afraid. We could begin to rationalize sin, justify it, explain it away, being like, well, you know, maybe it wasn't as bad. I was deceived, that sort of thing. And perhaps the most obvious one is that we can push off culpability, blame, onto others or even onto God. Like, well, God, if you hadn't even created me in the first place, I wouldn't have sinned. All of this stuff we could look at, and it would be, it would be edifying and encouraging for us as the body of Christ. They're good. And I'm sure you could find articles and sermons and Bible studies on these topics. But today, I really want to draw us and focus us in on that initial question. How do we make sense of the world? And how does Genesis 3 help us get there? First, that I think God would want you to know, and you might see this and be like, that? you came up with that, Tyler? Creation is good, yet fallen. The world is created by God, but it is corrupted. And there are a number of philosophies and religions that explain the problem of evil in alternative ways to the Christian story. So if you had the pleasure of living in 12,000, no, not 12,000, 1200 BC in uh, the Babylonian Empire, modern-day Iraq, you would have um, learned the creation story from the Enuma Elish, which is a Babylonian epic, was discovered about 100, 150 years ago. Um, And this Babylonian epic, the Enuma Elish, it has a creation story. But it's very different from our creation story. Because in this scenario, how we got to the world as it is, the world is a result of divine warfare. Meaning that all of these gods are competing for power. And the victorious god, who is named Marduk, he defeats Tiamat, and from the corpse and remains of Tiamat, Marduk forms the heavens and the earth, meaning that intrinsic to creation in this account is violence. And if you were to read through Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it's so peaceful, right? And so they would account for why is the world the way it is and say, well, It's just always been that way. That's how it was created. As Christians, we'd say, no, there was a time. There was a time where there was perfection, where what God created was fully uncorrupted. Other philosophies that might be uh, answers to this question, some say that humans are simply the product of evolutionary process, that our neurons, our synapses, they just fire as they do. We don't have free will or free choice. And so now we're just waiting out until we get to that point of the evolved state where we reach the point of harmony and peace. There were a number of 19th century philosophers that held this view of evolutionary progress, especially when it comes to human morality. And they like kind of use some language of Christianity, but if you and I were to look at it, we'd be like, that has nothing to do with what God has said to us in the Bible. And those 19th century philosophers, if they were to see what happened in our world, in Russia and in Europe and in Japan in the 20th century, they would say, there is no way humanity is progressing morally. The 20th century was a wake-up call to these, to these schools of philosophy. Other answers, some put it in the divine realm, that a good God is warring against a bad God, and evil exists because of that bad God's influence upon the world we would say God created everything good. And don't believe the lie that God and Satan are equal opposites. God is God. He is perfectly sovereign. Yes, the devil had some influence here, but it was just in temptation. 
It's not like Satan is exacting all these things. No. The story of Christianity is one of human disobedience. It's of human disobedience. So we would say that God created the world good and sin and death entered in because of human disobedience. So Mike talked last week about the image of God. And whether it's a Genesis 1 reality or a Genesis 3 and following reality, the image of God is something inherent. So all humanity, all human beings, whether they look like us, talk like us, whether they're young, whether they're old, whether they agree with us or not, they have inherent worth and value because they are created in the image of God. But that image has been corrupted. It has been marred. It has been scarred. So much so that a couple chapters later in Genesis 5, um, there, we're talking about um, Adam and Eve's youngest kid, Seth, is their third born. And the language is that Seth was born after the likeness and image of Adam. And that has continued down the line to you and me today. That we are not born morally neutral and some turn out good and some turn out bad. We're actually born into the condition of Adam, meaning that we rebel against God and displace his authority. And the baptism earlier, I think, illustrates that. Is that we might be tempted to think, oh, that, that baby's perfect and cute in every way. Uh, no, I think the scriptural account would um, push back at that a little bit. It's also important to note that death was not original to God's good creation. We say the world is good, yet fallen. There was no death in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And death is a consequence of sin. You might know the scripture, for the wages of sin is death. Now I think in some ways, we talk about human disobedience I think like, we can wrap our heads around that a little bit um, because we see it in each other. Like, you know that you are not perfect. You know that others around you are not perfect. So you can kind of make sense of that and saying, yeah, I can make sense of the world with that. But something that can be harder to, to make sense of, and I don't even fully understand it, it's that the human disobedience here in the story of Adam and Eve fractured not just humans' relationship with God, but it fractured the entirety of creation. Nature, animals. And so we get these unspeakable tragedies of wildfires and the floods that our area incurred last year, where it is not part of God's good creation for those things to happen and to inflict pain. But it's an effect of human disobedience. And so here's what I would want you to know, and I believe God would want you to know, and it really comes down to what you're expecting out of the world, is that we should not be surprised by fallenness, by other people's sins, by our own sins, by a breakdown of the natural order, by injustice, by oppression. You cannot expect perfection in an imperfect world. I think a lot of us, we get into these rhythms of disillusionment and disappointment because we're expecting things to be perfect. We expect things to go great. And the reality is, yes, the world is good, but it's fallen. And so that doesn't mean that we set our expectations bare low, like just don't expect anything to ever be good. It'll all stink. That, God don't want that for you. And the reason I'd say that is that even in Genesis 3, we see the seed of hope. Genesis 3.15, it's sometimes referred to as the first gospel. This is God speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. But notice in this next line, he shall crush your head, meaning the offspring of Eve isn't necessarily going to battle with the serpent's offspring. It comes back to the serpent himself, Satan himself. He, the offspring, shall crush your head, serpent, Satan, enemy, and you shall bruise his heel. We're looking forward to Jesus. 
And like I said earlier, there's a place to learn from Genesis 3 how to withstand temptation. The short answer is flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But it would be so sad if the best that you would pull from Genesis 3 is how to be a little bit more equipped and how to withstand temptation. There's a place for that. Because our confidence is not in our ability to obey God. Our confidence is not in your resolve to do better next time. If you are a Christian, your confidence is in the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ. So here's what Paul would say in Romans chapter 5. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The New Testament refers to Jesus as the second Adam, and you can see it in that scripture. By the one man, meaning Adam, his disobedience, many of us were made sinners, all of us. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Adam prefigures and foreshadows Jesus. And as we're trying to make sense of the world, we will misunderstand Adam's story if Jesus is left out. If you stop at Genesis 3 and you're trying to make sense of the world, we will misunderstand it if Jesus is left out. Here's what I mean. If the fallen condition of all humanity is wrapped up in Adam, then our redeemed and renewed condition is wrapped up in Jesus. Think about Jesus' obedience. Early in the Gospels, Jesus is baptized. He comes out of the water and a voice from heaven, the, the firm endorsement of the Father falls on him and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Beautiful moment. The very next verse says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. To be tempted. Tempted by the same devil who used the same tactics of trying to twist God's word in order to accomplish his purposes. And where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus withstood that temptation. There was tempting in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is wrestling with his father saying, is there another way? Don't you think Jesus was tempted to say, Father, please. But he obeyed the Father's will. And even on the cross, nails through his wrists, the Roman soldier yells up to him, if indeed you are the Son of God, come down and save yourself. I have to believe that there was something in Jesus. He was saying, that, that's very tempting because this is excruciating but I am going to obey the will of the Father. So much in Philippians 2, we read that Jesus was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted the name of Jesus so that at his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Adam's disobedience brought death. And so Christ, the only one in human history who was perfectly obedient to the will of God and because of that was not subject to the penalty of death, Jesus willingly took on that death, rose from the grave so that all of us who are baptized into Jesus' death can share in his resurrection life. Do you see how it all comes full circle? If you stop at Genesis 3, you might have some encouragement, you might have some inspiration to do better next time, but you're not going to have that second Adam. And you need that second Adam. You need Jesus. You need the one who took on that death for you so that you can share in his resurrection. 
The relationship that Adam and Eve lost with God through their disobedience, Jesus has restored that relationship through his obedience. You know how we talk about creation in Genesis 1? The Bible has a lot to say about new creation. The very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, in the end, God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. There's a scripture in Isaiah 66, my wife and I were looking at earlier this week, speaking of this new heavens and new earth, where it said it's going to be so amazing that the former things will not be remembered. It is going to be so incredible when God remakes everything that we're not even going to remember the pain and the difficulty and the trials of this life. That's some good news, isn't it? So that's the story you're living in. It's a Genesis 3 story, but it's also a Revelation 22 story. And that is how you make sense of the world. It's how you make sense of the pain. It's how you make sense of the difficulty of the suffering. Theologians have a a phrase for this, and it's called the now and the not yet. Meaning that there are partial fulfillments of what God wants to do in the world because of the coming of Jesus. So the first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospels is that the kingdom of God is here. It is now. But we can look at the suffering and pain around us and say, surely not everything is under the rule and reign of Jesus yet. The kingdom of God is now. And it's not yet. It's both. If you've experienced answers to prayer, where God breaks through in in miracles and provision and healing, you'd say, man, the will of God and his, his perfect accomplishment and sovereignty over history is now. But we've all had those moments, those times. Maybe you're in the middle of it right now. You say, I'm praying for something and God's not coming through. I don't want to do with that. To that I would say, the will of God is sometimes a not yet reality. We live in the middle of it. Salvation, the now reality, is that we are saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. But one day, that not yet reality is that you and I are gonna be saved from the mere presence of sin. In that new heavens and new earth, there will be no sin. Even the devil and his temptations. He has been decisively defeated on the cross. That is a now reality. But he also prowls around like a lion seeking someone to devour. That's also a now reality. But one day, when Jesus returns, the accusations of the enemy will be once and for all and permanently silenced. That's not yet. Would you stand with me? There's one more now and not yet I want to highlight, and that is the nature of death. You know, we'll sing songs, and Easter Sunday we'll say, Death is defeated! And everyone say, Amen, and they'll clap. Some of you clapped with me. God bless you. Man, I was at a funeral of a loved one who died way too soon of a gal in our small group last week. And the now reality is that we do have the promise of eternal life in Jesus. But unless Jesus returns, you and I are going to die. And yet, in that not yet reality, What 1 Corinthians says is that the final enemy to be put to death is death. And so we're going to end today with one of my favorite worship songs around here. I have the ability to say that because... (laughs) Um, Death was arrested. We'll sing that phrase, death was arrested and my life began. I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the phrase arrested. One, you might think through the lens of like a cardiac arrest, meaning that like the, the ability to, to breathe and your heartbeat is like, it's, it's not happening. 
And so if death is being personified, we would say death is arrested, meaning it has lost its life and my life has begun because of what Jesus has done. I think that's a great way to interpret it. But also, this might be a little silly, so just track with me. When I think about this song, I imagine Jesus as a policeman. Think like big security guard Tony, like don't mess with him kind of guy. And he goes up to death And he said, because of my death and resurrection, death, you are arrested, and I'm throwing you into prison. Death still happens, but life with God triumphs now, and even more so, not yet. And as we worship today, as we praise Jesus for his grace, for his truth, for his triumph over death, sin, and the devil, that we experience now and not yet. I wonder if we can bring a taste of the worship from new heavens and new earth into the now. The joy, the celebration, the freedom, the inhibition of saying Jesus is worthy. Come and join the song of all the redeemed. Amen?